so I, um, I appreciate everyone um, uh, coming today so what we're gonna do uh, in these next couple of slides is we're just going to link um, mental health and addiction so the question is um, the when when we have a um, when we have a family member who has addiction the question is is why do they do what they do and how does it happen that things get out of control and so, and so at NOM uh, we like to adopt what's known as a treatment paradigm what that means is is how do we understand addiction and mental health so that we can um, uh, so that we can treat something so if we if we if we uh, a lot of times in our current system addiction you go to the addiction center if you have a mental health problem you go to the mental health center and if you have a chronic pain problem you go to the chronic pain center but if you have addiction and chronic pain the addiction people don't know what to do with you and the chronic pain people don't know what to do with you or if you have mental health and addiction it, it, it's there's there's uh, um, uh, it's, it doesn't fit easily anywhere and yet it's very common when addiction and mental health all happen together and so we link it and here's how we link it at no so addiction starts oftentimes uh, uh, from a childhood perspective so uh, there's 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 problems in life so we have uh, um, some degree of of, uh, of trauma that uh, there's there's uh, attachment wounds that can come from um, just some you know difficult times growing up and then head injuries we know that head injuries uh, cause lasting damage and there's all sorts of movies and things out on this uh, such as what uh, Will Smith uh, 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 made a great movie called Concussion that really brought to light that concussions don't actually fully heal and they are emotional memory uh, um, uh, effects that result from repeated head injuries uh, such as from a career in sports like uh, hockey or, or boxing or football uh, but even the head injuries we sustain growing up even if it's just one can have lasting emotional impairments so this mix of things we call that trauma attachment wounds and concussions and so what a lot of this when we have something like that it gives us this idea of emotional dysregulation and so emotional dysregulation is um, uh, is, 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 is when we have emotional problems, extreme fits of anger, of rage, of depression, of sadness, up and down, up and down, uh, not being able to sleep, uh, sometimes pain. All of these things can be manifestations of, of uh, the emotional problems that are coming from all of this trauma and attachment wounds and concussions. And so that's not very pleasant. It's not very happy. And so what people do then is they they got to cope somehow because, you know, even though you don't feel good, you still got to get up in the day to go to school or go to work or be a father or be a mother. You still got to function during the day. So... What people do is they have to cope with all the negative emotion. And they do this. Uh, usually, oftentimes healthy coping mechanisms have not been sufficiently learned or, or built in. Uh, so then people go to the negative ones. So that's the substance and non-substance abuse related things. Um, so like someone has a drink when they're 16, because they live in a lot of stress caused by all this stuff, they 
they, 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 they feel better than usual when they drink the alcohol. It helps not just ha helps have a good night, but it actually takes the pain away. It takes the, the, the exhaustion away. It takes away for a period uh, some of the, the, the hurt that they've been living with. And so, but it's not just substances. People can cope with other things too, like food. So disordered eating. So this is common. We even have a word for it, comfort food. You know, when you're, you've had a bad day, you go home and you have a bag of chips. And the chips are creating a um, bunch of food. Uh, uh, when that comes into your stomach, it stretches the belly, which releases uh, hormones that make you feel good in the head. And so if that makes the pain not so big, then we do that more. So negative coping can be many, many things. And so the um, hurting oneself, a lot of people, they kind of, they get into cutting. So like cutting, inflicting pain, um, that can create distraction. So there's lots of ways we can cope negatively with the emotional problems. And obviously, if you keep doing these things, you get what we call aftermath. You get problems. Um, so if you keep drinking your problems away, you get addiction. Addiction oftentimes means things like jail, hospital, you know, relationship problems, child services, you, know, you get some homelessness, um, suicide attempts, violence, chronic pain. There's many ways. And this is what we collectively call the aftermath. And how does this actually come and happen in life? It actually happens like this. It starts in early life, adverse childhood experiences. It always starts in early life. Uh, and the way it goes, it's like, a, it's like a snowball. It starts at a younger age, and then those experiences create emotional problems that are, in the, in, in, uh, for example... Um, things are tough, you get bullied a lot in school, and you get an anger issue, and you sort of, uh, um, you, 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 maybe a buddy tells you to uh, try smoking a joint, uh, like marijuana, and then you get caught, and so then you get suspended from school. So, that aftermath, that suspension from school, then becomes the new trauma. It becomes the new problem. And because those healthy ways of coping have not been built and developed, the person doesn't know what's going on. All they know is they're more upset. They're more depressed. They're more angry. So maybe they... Smoke more marijuana. And they do this, they get caught again, and maybe they get expelled from school. And then that leads to more trauma, because parents aren't happy. This is anyone's story. This is just an example of many stories that we see uh, at NOM and, and, and certainly other centers. That creates more problems which creates even more coping, which creates even bigger problems. Let's say they get into alcohol and they keep drinking and they, um, you know, uh, get in a car accident. So every step produces a bigger problem, which produces more emotional problems, not less. And because there's no positive learning of healthy coping strategies, the previous problems get added on to the next ones and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and 
usually that by the time they're seeing us we're talking about really bad things like you know near-death experiences hospitalizations child services relationship uh, strained to the point of breaking and ultimately uh, death and so this is here's an example of how an immigrant uh, might might experience this so uh, just as an example this is a, a very common example of how it happens so someone who's hit a lot as a child sees a lot of family drama uh, then uh, so they have kind of they, 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 they have some problems growing up not the healthiest in terms of coping strategies and then like many immigrants do they immigrate at a young age and like most immigrants uh, they they go and uh, they get married soon after immigration at a young age and uh, unbeknownst to most people when the psychologist did a study of the people who are uh, of, of the life's most stressful events number one is when the parents uh, 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 if, if someone's parents pass away that's one of the that's, that's that was considered number one most stressful life event but number two is actually marriage the first couple of months or, or year of marriage is oftentimes uh, the most stressful so this person who has not developed healthy coping strategies immigrates and then gets married because the thought is is um, a full complete life will sort of control things but immigration is tough people are very busy people start working multiple jobs and then that coping gets out of hand and so then you have a drunk driving charge you lose job financial stress um, sometimes divorce and it's not like people learn their lesson because the trouble is is they don't know how at a very young age it's not is it you we are everything we know about stress management is actually learned between 0 and 11 emotionally the first couple of years of life those first 10 11 12 13 years of life that's when we've emotionally learned a lot of things after that intellectual development becomes dominant and so as life stress piles up people go to more and more coping because addiction is the disease of more it's the disease of more because the nature of the human mind and the body is that the more uh, uh, we do to numb out the more our body adjusts to that and it's just not enough so we need to do more so that's why people oftentimes start drinking a little but then the dose increases because they need more because their system is adapting even though they get health problems and so people get cirrhosis and ultimately death jail uh, or homelessness is typically where where people end up when addiction is not uh, is left uh, untreated and so I like to understand it like a spiral and a complex sort of set of interwoven and interconnected states and I oftentimes use a yarn ball uh, to illustrate this and so my trusty yarn ball is right here and I think I'm just going to try to get it out here there we are good so uh, I use a yarn ball to uh, illustrate this so what by the time they come and see us it's usually when things are really bad so sometimes we get also we get a question you know what's this treatment center why aren't you guys doing something and I would have to say of addiction mental health and chronic pain once addiction sets in, it's very, very heavy, dense, and, and quite deep. It always is. Uh, the person's life is not just simply like 10 things, like or uh, 7 or 8 things, like I've mentioned here. It's probably hundreds, thousands, 
hundreds of thousands of repetitions of this and that makes for a very complex mental uh, state and so this state oftentimes resembles uh, a yarn ball and so it doesn't get better quickly uh, what happens is is this yarn ball this kind of thing that I've, I've written here as a spiral what happens is it begins to just pull this person like gravity towards a way of being uh, and I call this the black hole of dysfunctional old patterns black hole is a term from physics so black holes are at the center of our galaxy and they keep all the stars circling it uh, and 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 every star if it lives long enough it gets really big gets bigger and bigger and then it collapses and it becomes so dense that even light can't escape it so it becomes a black hole which is an ultra dense bunch of uh, space that is so, so high gravity, it sucks in light. And that's why it looks black. And, but it's invisible. You can't actually see it. <laughs> uh, if you look, right, you look in a galaxy, you can't actually see a black hole. Um, because its nature is invisible. You know a black hole's there because things are spiraling around it, circling. You know, you have like, you, you have your, your, it's very clear if you look at a picture of the Milky Way that it's kind of all looks like it's turning around something and that's it's turning around a black hole. So I use the black hole analogy because this is what the inside of someone's mind is like. By the time they get to Nam, this is what it's like. It's dense. It is invisible to the point of, you know, just thinking, oh, this person is just being a jerk. They're doing this because they want to or because they don't respect me or us. They're, 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 they're doing this because of whatever number of reasons. Um, but the actual reason why they're doing this is quite invisible because it's, it's a complex set of events interwoven over time. So we call this the black hole of dysfunctional patterns. And it takes a healthy person and it pulls them, it pulls them, oh, uh, just what happened there, something happened. Um, so just a technical difficulty here. Hmm. Okay, good. So, it takes a person and it actually pulls them uh, in this direction. They can't help it. It's quite involuntary, much like uh, um, the sun is, is pulling the earth around it and the sun and the earth can't resist it. It's gravity and it's caught in the orbit and it will be pulled. So these symptoms, the, 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 the emotional problems, uh, and I put pain here because a lot of pain is emotional. Uh, uh, and because the mind and the body are connected, you know, you have the part of the body that's kind of the... Uh, in black is the body, and in red is the mind. It's a grafted onto the body. We know this. This, is new. this isn't new science anymore. The mind-body connection is well adjusted. And so if your elbow hurts or your back hurts, the question is, is it the mind part of the body or is the body part of the body? And a lot of times when it comes to addiction, mental health, chronic pain, uh, it is the uh, mind part of the body uh, that is giving referred pain to that area. And so healing that oftentimes can reduce the intensity of the pain a lot. So you get this pull towards the way of being and it's as involuntary as us trying to sort of resist gravity. If I drop this ball, it drops. There's no resisting it uh, unless I put time and energy. So the inside of the mind, like a black hole, black hole pulling the person, the person, the ideal version of your wife, your husband, your 
your father, your mother, your daughter, whoever the person is with the addiction, and they have something invisible pulling them. And what that looks like is a lot of lies, excuses, letdowns, absence. It doesn't look pretty. Addiction is the disease of lies. I get used to it day in, day out. Lots of people lie to me. Even just now, I was uh, seeing someone clearly intoxicated. <laughs> did you did you drink or drug? Uh, someone, uh, so and so, and uh, no, no, doc, no, no, not me, never me. And it's just it's it's not offensive because I know they have a black hole pulling them towards this way of being, and they can't help it. So this is a very important concept. Uh, for families to understand if they want to understand the road forward. So what is that road forward? So you have a dense black hole and it's pulling a person down. It's pulling them towards them and that person wants to stop. The first step to healing is for us to put pillars in place to prop up, to stop the person from kind of being pulled. So much like this ball is being held by gravity, but it's not, be, it's not going to the floor because I'm holding it. I'm putting energy in to hold it. As long as I eat my food, as long as I can, you know, sustain the energy, this ball is not going to hit that floor. And so this is where we have to start. We call it stabilization. And we use all sorts of things, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. And people have to hang out here for a while to kind of be okay. In, in, for example, it might involve learning to exercise. It might involve some therapy. It might involve hanging out with other people, struggling with the same thing. It might involve meditating or praying. And so, in the early stages, we're all about just stopping the fall. We want to just stop the fall, and if it keeps falling, we just keep putting more and more pillars, and sometimes we even have to house people. We sometimes even have to stop them from working, so that they can just focus, until the free fall stops. And then, and then, uh, during that time, so at NAM we have various programs, our personalized recovery program, support groups, we have, neuro, we have a lot of technologies we use to sort of support this process. And sometimes, you know, you're holding it, and sometimes it slips a little bit, people relapse. It's okay, we just kind of pick up the pieces again, and we... Continue to stabilize until we know, okay, it's not falling anymore. And then the next step has to be this. It has to be starting to unwind. So we first we find that one point. Everyone has a point where they can start. No one ha doesn't have that point, but sometimes families can't see it because there's been a lot of hurt and a lot of difficulty. But everyone has one, so oftentimes you need professionals to help because they're they're independent. So they find this very first point, and then gently we start to pull. Initially, it's it's us that's pulling. Uh, initially, it's kind of. Um, uh, slow and what this has this effect the effect this has is that it reduces the intensity of the gravity if this thing if this black hole kind of shrinks a little it's going to pull less because all these pillars are really hard to maintain at that intensity like 
you know, if someone has to live away from their family for a while, how long can they live away from their family? How long can you not work? How long can you, you be outside of your social system? And the answer is not forever. You can't be living in a bubble forever. So at some point, we have to do something to weaken this. And for that, we have all sorts of technologies. We have trauma therapies. We have groups. We have AA. There's, all, there's many ways. But the next step has to be unwinding. The reality is, the system, it actually doesn't work like, okay, we stabilize and then we start unwinding. It doesn't work that way because if all of a sudden, imagine if someone all of a sudden weakened the, the gravity in the middle of, or weakened the earth, or weakened the sun. So the earth is going around the sun, and if that's some, let's say someone came around and all of a sudden dropped the gravity pull of the sun. All of a sudden, you would have, the earth is like spinning, maybe the earth just leaves orbit, spins in some other direction, and then everyone freezes to death. That's not great. The thing is, is that if we make sudden changes, if we make sudden changes, if we shrink this too quickly, we actually get a backlash. And that backlash can, can be, uh, at a minimum, relapse. But sometimes it can be even more severe. Um, people can go, go, and, go and do things, like suicide. Or they can get, they can get uh, unstable. Or, or more often than not, it's, it's they, 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 they leave therapy and they go back to doing what they were doing. And now they're afraid. So... The reality is, is when we work with someone, we have to stabilize them. Let, once we unwind a little, we have to hold here for a little bit. And once they're stable, we just start unwinding again. Just like a yarn ball. And as we unwind, we say, oh, okay, you know what? It's enough. Uh, we need to just hold out. Until the system adjusts. Because you have to understand, even though this looks messy, even though a person is kind of in this big spiral, you have to understand that they, um, they're like this for a reason. It's kind of like a person in, in, who's like standing in the mud. So just imagine a person in the mud, right? And the mud is up to here, right up to the nose. And, it's, and, 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 and some other person comes by and they're like, hey, you look like you're standing in the mud and, it, and you're just barely breathing. And the person says, okay, well, I, let, let me let me let me let me just uh, move this thing and try to shift uh, shift it. And the person in the mud says, "No, don't touch me. I'm fine." And they mean it because that person in the mud knows that if their mud moves just a little bit, they won't be able to breathe. That mud or that water will come into their nose, and that's the only thing keeping them alive. And so people who are standing in the mud, they stand in just the right way to just increase their height. It's not comfortable, it's not good for their body, but it's what they have to do to stay alive. And so every coping that people do, even alcohol, even drugs, you have to ask yourself the question, why has this person not committed suicide? Um all those years ago because when people don't have a way out they have no other way to cope the mind will turn to that and so a lot of times alcohol has kept someone alive coping with their problems not in a great way but coping so the inside of people's minds are designed in such a way that they're creating 
uh, a lot of toxic habits, but they're like that for a very good reason, and it serves a purpose. And if we're going to change it, we have to go very slow. And after we do some, we have to pause. Pause for a little, and then continue. And from the outside, like this ball, you know, from here to here, it doesn't look much different. Not much looks, you know, if someone's looking from the outside in, they're like, hey, you haven't changed much. Nothing's changed. You're going to all these meetings and stuff, but you're still the same kind of person. But the reality is, they're not. They've unwound a little. And the process of unwinding is lifelong. It's lifelong. The benefits of unwinding, they don't take that long. But they take more than two weeks. They take more than eight weeks. Usually they take years. A lot of times, all we're doing in treatment is we're teaching them how to unwind themselves, which is daily, which is little bit by little bit, which is unwind and stop until your system adjusts and then start unwinding again. So for a person with addiction, what that means is, even after they come back home to their families, that doesn't mean their healing is done. They're going to continue to need to go to therapy. They're need to, going to continue to need to go to meetings. Sometimes a family will say, well, you've, un you've unwound so, so much already. Aren't you done yet? Come, help out with all the stuff you haven't done in 20 years. And the addict, the addicted person, feels a lot of shame. And then this gravity becomes really strong because this gravity is powered by shame and stress. So when stress and shame are given to this gravity, it becomes ultra strong and it pulls that person. So oftentimes, right before the court date, right before when really, you know, uh, the time when the in-laws come and visit, right before most important times in life, birthdays, graduations, a person goes and relapses. And the family thinks, what a jerk. They don't care. And the reality is, is very much they do care. The stress of that event supercharges the gravity. And tomorrow we'll talk about the neurobiology of this. Because this is backed by hundreds of years of science. Stress, addiction is a stress-induced defect. And so when we... Uh, when we stress out a person with addiction, they stop unwinding and they start, they, they, they relapse to previous patterns. They start lying, they start going to alcohol, drugs, doing all those things that have damaged their families and themselves. And so this happens. Relapse is a part of recovery. People relapse for years before coming to a point of stability because it's a complicated problem. The ball of yarn is complicated. But people ask me all the time, Dr. Gill, why do you want to go and work with addicts? What do you get out of this? And I tell them that underneath the, the ugliness of addictive behavior, and it is ugly, very much so. It's not social. It's not healthy. It's not spiritually, biologically, psychologically, or socially healthy. And it's very hard to live with someone like that. And the hurt caused by someone with addiction is very real. But it's not them. It's the disease. And the disease is this black hole. And it unwinds like this. One meeting after another. And eventually, people do make it. And this is why I do this. Me, Bupinder, Mindy, the team at NAM, other treatment centers were not the only game in town takes a village, we see the success. And so it, someone relapses, someone gets back into old patterns, swears at us, does stuff, doesn't bother us. Because, because the 
um, the journey. Sorry, I'm just going to erase some of this. Because the journey, this is the trajectory of the journey. The journey um, of a person with addiction, they have to show the willingness first, but it takes years. And the tr always the truth is, is families usually, they lag recovery one to three years after sobriety and authentic recovery. That's when families feel safe enough to heal. And so this is how it usually goes. And that's why it takes so long. And we have to create a realistic perspective. If you think things should happen faster, then you're going to make yourself very upset. And I know, I know places in the world, that, like one guy was telling us, he went to India, he went to a place, and they said, we'll cure your addiction. We'll change out your blood, give you a transfusion, and you'll be good. You won't use again. And give us three luck, to, you know, rupees. I mean, obviously a guy came to our program, so it didn't work out for him. I'm sure that center did not return their, their money. But the thing is, is that there's a lot of things out there. Promises. You give us 70,000, I've heard, you know, give us $70,000 um, in one month and we'll, 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 we'll sort of do this thing. We'll fix your guy. And the reality is, healing happens like this, step by step. Stabilize and unwind, stabilize and unwind. And after your loved one comes back to you, if they've went away, they're going to need support in continuing this. And so, how long does it take? Sometimes a ball of yarn is very small. Sometimes people come to us and we say, go to Alcoholics Anonymous. A person does that. They like it. They start doing the work. They start taking responsibility. They start doing stuff. And they unwind quickly. And they learn quickly. Other balls of yarn, and I think that's a real ball of yarn, it's I think the world's biggest ball of yarn, is on that truck. Other balls of yarn are a little bit more complicated. And so the thing is, is that the there's always hope. There's always hope. But here's one thing that I can tell you. It doesn't have to take as long as it does. One of the biggest reasons why we like to treat families is because we know if the family is healing at the same time or even before the patient, if they're healing their wounds, it creates a community at home that can talk about healing. There's nothing more powerful he in healing than someone saying to someone, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I hurt you. That's part of an addict addicted person's treatment, is to say I'm sorry. But a lot of times, a family hears I'm sorry, and they just think of 20 years of hurt, of pain, and they get really upset. And they say a lot of things. And this person who's trying to heal, they start winding up again. And so why it takes so long, and why it doesn't need to, is if families can learn this, then that'll happen a lot less. If families can talk together, if they can learn, if families can learn their own ways to manage the stress, this person if they can learn what the person is doing, treatment is simply connect to self, connect to others, commit to daily practice. If your loved one is doing this, they're unwinding the ball of yarn. And as they're winding, unwinding the ball of yarn, they're just going to their meetings, they're meditating every day, and yes, it takes time out of their family life. But that's the activity that's unwinding the ball of yarn. 
Sometimes it'll be faster when they go to a center. Sometimes it'll be slower when they're just holding. But if a family is patient, if they learn to balance soft love and tough love, as we teach tomorrow, if they, families, find another outlet for their hurt, because your addicted person can't handle your pain, not early on, not within the first many months and sometimes years of recovery. They can't fully hear the truth from families. But that means the families need to find some other place to take that feeling because that feeling is real and it needs to be addressed. If there's kids of a person with addiction, they, by having that that uh, that experience, going to meetings, there's kids, uh, there's youth groups for Alcohol Al-Anon, which is the family support group um, uh, for people who have family members who are addicted to alcohol. If a family, adult family, they go to Al-Anon or they go to other recovery programming that involves families, it will help the ball of yarn un keep unwinding. Because all of you have your ball of yarn too. Your inside of your mind is also like this. It might not be as bad or as hurt as the person with the addiction. But you have this too. And if you unwind it, what you'll find is, is magical things happen. People with addiction get better in record speed. In IFSP, we say this is getting and learning how to do recovery will actually shorten the amount of time that it takes for the addicted person to heal. This isn't a guarantee. I give no guarantees. Addiction is a deadly disease. People die of addiction every day. 80 people a week suicide in Canada. I give no guarantees because life is very, very difficult long before someone comes here for help. But what we know is if someone engages and they keep on engaging and they get support, if they would have taken five years to recover, if the family is engaged, they might take one or two to get to a highly functional state. And so we see it all the time. Today I met a guy who just hadn't worked in years and he found a job for the first time in a very long time. And that's how it happens. Sometimes fast, sometimes slow, but eventually the person's ball of yarn actually comes loose. And the healing happens. And so this is the reality. And the only difference between this and, a, and an actual, the actual reality is that a person doesn't have one ball of yarn, uh, one string. They probably have many. It's probably all kind of a lot of different yarn. It's all mixed up together. But the beautiful thing is holistic approaches are available and they can help. And certainly at NOM we use a lot of different technologies to assist and help uh, accelerate the process. And the families, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, you're, if you're watching this video or if you're attending some of the programs, um, uh, I'm so excited uh, because this is, this is the single best thing a family can do to support and get back their loved one before things break to the point of uh, just uh, uh, the breakdown. And so I think that's where I'll end uh, the this uh, this segment uh, today and I'm just going to stop this thank you and if I misspoke my sincerest apologies uh, and thank you for listening